Before commencing this review any further, there will be some heavy spoilers throughout this video. If you wish to go into this film Cold Turkey, then I will suggest watching this after viewing the movie for yourself. I appreciate your time, common courtesy, and your company. Thank you so much for understanding. Spider-Man No Way Home is nothing short of suspenseful, jaw-dropping, and quite simply amazing. This is the third rendition to the Spider-Man mythos within the Marvel Cinematic Universe. During the Tower Bridge incident, we witnessed Mysterio framing Peter Parker for the drone strike that occurred in London. The final trump card was akin to a cyanide injection against Peter Parker's personal life, only strengthened by revealing that Peter Parker and Spider-Man are one in the same. The movie picks up directly after Far From Home with J. Jonah Jameson's scolding accusation, and we're off to the races once the world knows who Spider-Man really is. I love how they made an Iron Boy Jr joke within the first few minutes, which felt like a bitter irony. A few demographics felt that Tom Holland's Spider-Man has always been green behind the ears, having a codependency on Tony Stark. Some fans have been yearning for the principles involving MCU Spider-Man growing up with actual stakes, pain, and responsibility behind the mantle. I'm pleased to say that any expectations involving a lack of growth has been shattered with this movie alone. Tom Tom Holland's performance just erupts with a good balance of humanization, emotions involving doubt, happiness, sorrow, and wrath. We'll touch up on that final point soon, I promise. But we have to address the plotting first act. Yes, if you didn't like Homecoming or Far From Home, then you will notice that there is several hijinks that will occur as Peter tries living a routine life in the spotlight. I guess normality involves the goddamn blind lawyer from Hell's Kitchen because I went ballistic when I saw Charlie Cox as Matt Murdock on the silver screen. I went crazy this was amazing like holy shit he didn't do much in this movie outside of catching a brick and talking legal representation lawyer mumbo jumbo through and through still do you want anything else from this glorious cameo i don't think you do right like could you ask for anything else after the fact no i don't think so this paints a grander picture in the fan base that daredevil has to continue at some point through some format it begs the question how far will this run go under a different leadership does that mean that the netflix shows are now canon prior to the decimation the blip the snap where was Daredevil during that time? Considering that Kingpin is also canonized, we have this moment just for us. A bright future is etched out in blood and stone from the man who can't stay down. For this opening section, they do fall into conventional MCU tropes, humor, and a teen slice of life that you come to expect from these characters. Honestly, I didn't mind these things being conveyed because this is all focal to Spider-Man growing up, growing up from a teenager and becoming a man. This is all focal to Spider-Man and the duality behind it. Given the worst kept secret in the world, I think it's fine to say that the main protagonist did not get fully overshadowed by the high echelon of cast and crew in this movie. MCU Spider-Man hatches a plan to Scooby-Doo this shit due to Ned Lees and Michelle Jones losing their college MIT via guilt by association. Peter then gets the not so bright idea which employs Doctor Strange into the picture, giving people one more day vibes with enchantments and creating solutions, except you know, it's actually good, right? I think I'll never stop lambasting on how poor the storytelling was with one more day. Anyway, Peter needs assistance so that the world will forget this identity crisis once more with a powerful spell. However, the premise causes Peter to second guess when the world will forget about him. This includes all the people that he really cares for. After reservation from Parker, Doctor Strange messes up the spell, leading to the frightening reality involving the multiverse, a universe where knowledge is vastly limited, even by Strange's mindset. 
I think this movie did a good job not giving Strange too much supplemental story as Peter smacks him across the Grand Canyon with the math equation. It's moving cogs in the machine that presses on what needs to be established and what is more important. I would say that I would be an immediate liar if I still didn't enjoy the giant fight between Doctor Strange and Spider-Man in the mirror world. What you pay the ticket for is the multiversal concept involving previous villains like Doc Ock, The Lizard, Electro, Norman Osborn, and Sandman crossing over into this world. If you're a gigantic nerd who likes Raimi Spider-Man or the Amazing Spider-Man, then you will literally have an orgasm since they brought back the original cast for this particular legion of bad guys. They're all locked in containment at some point in time after they're defeated by Spider-Man and they are ordered to be sent back into a portal to their own time. Strange tells Peter that the final solution was for them to go home and die which seals their original fate. If we hit the rewind button, some of these villains were pulled in before the moment they were killed. That's the whole mantra. That's the whole philosophy, right? I also think that they copped out on never highlighting the issue as to why Sandman or Lizard didn't die at the end of their movies respectively. I thought that Kevin Feige said that this plot point was going to be wrapped up in this movie. Either way it's not so don't go in expecting as much. As I said, these two characters are habitually sidelined which is kind of sad in a way when you really think about it. They don't get any big defining moments when you put Octavius Electro and Green Goblin in the same space. They're here for show as I talk about all this prior conflict. The villains do a good job for what they were given though. Granted, some might feel like immediate bench warmers compared to standouts like Melina or Defoe. It's two hours and 30 minutes long, so this rapid pace was going to be brought into the fray against these characters. William Defoe is a masterstroke villain. He's the one that makes everything culminate to a sinister degree. See? They call him the Sinister Five, but he's the scariest one. Maybe it should be the Sinister One, one man, one elf. That sounds like that pornography description that was created in Watch Dogs 2. You know what? Never mind. Forget I said anything because it's getting a little too weird in here. Osborne tries assisting Peter with the power cure as they all believe they can go back to their respective multiverse without buying the farm here. No Way Home culminates its namesake when this plan falls into hot magma for a reason. The reason is due to Norman Osborn reverting back to the Green Goblin persona yet again, which you probably saw coming from a mile away if you saw Spider-Man 1. Spidey senses are heightened when psychosis will reign supreme and you'll resonate with the worst pain that MCU Peter has felt in a long time. The maniacal Green Goblin fights down to ground level with an impressive display of destruction here. I thought it was beautiful even. It made me question how strong Norman was that entire time with the whole experiment that he had. It was so good. And hey, at least Tom Holland got to do his routine technique because he said he took a maneuver from Spider-Man PS4 and implemented it in this movie and it was awesome. We call that a high risk maneuver in the wrestling world, baby. Anyway, it ends with a massive pumpkin bomb exploding the main lobby into dust. Peter holds Aunt May, the last of his family, who was bleeding out from the explosion. It was nothing but dead silence during this entire scene, as we now witness a Spider-Man who doesn't have any parental figures in his life anymore. A grave injustice was served as Ben Parker and May Parker in this universe are now dead. The only thing MCU Peter wants at this point is to kill the goblin, which came out naturally. It was quite shocking to see this path being taken. Then we get to that money shot that you all been waiting for. The world's worst kept secret, the secret that made Andrew Garfield choke on a fidget spinner during each and every single interview. This was the moment where Ned Lees used the magic ring to signify his desire to have Peter back. 
the ring makes an imminent spark for those who wishes what they want and then we look in awe to see what's going on mj goes him to do it again causing an interdimensional rift to form in the living room then in comes andrew garfield spider-man from the amazing spider-man films the prevalent amount of fan service erupted into something. It erupted something in me. It's something that felt like this was a once in a lifetime experience. You sit there flabbergasted about the whole thing with the multiversal connectivity and then you know it's not over yet. There's a second portal that pops up and Tobey Maguire Spider-Man casually walks into the picture at this point we all lost our collective shit in the movie theater this meant the world to every spider-man fan across the planet you had to be there to witness this pure brilliance toby acts like the lovable seasoned vet of the movie cool calm and collected with lumbar support that could bend like a slim jim back it's one little nitpick that irked me here and there and that occurs when toby starts talking about a deja vu where he says he's seen ned and mj before he also has a higher sense to help out tom holland spider-man who is in some emotional pain right now this concept is strange because andrew garfield never illustrated this same deja vu about knowing who these people are venom also had the same familiarity with mcu spider-man when he was blipped into the universe so does that mean that emotions are changed when you enter the multiverse you can either be oblivious you can have deja vu or you can have negative reactions to new people you haven't seen immediately i don't know hopefully dr strange in the multiverse of madness explains this concept just a little bit more in detail i just think they wanted a cool youth pastor to say something meaningful without any real thought or reasoning here regardless both Spider-Men attack each other until they realize they're both on the same team. Then we find Tom, who is weeping in the rain, signifying he's done with this meaningless crusade after Aunt May's death. At this point, the other Spider-Men begin to have a moment. They begin to share their understanding about foreboding consequences when they fight their enemies. The movie takes a breather. It reels in that collective pain that is dispersed between each individual toby said that vengeance got him what he wanted yet he never really felt good about inadvertently killing one of the robbers involved with uncle ben's death andrew turned into a cold bitter spider-man who hurt a lot of criminals after gwen stacy died he stopped pulling his punches quote unquote he stopped being peter parker which perfectly explains why when he comes through that portal he comes through there with a spider-man outfit on and nothing else he's pursuing more vigilante justice to fill that void with great power comes great responsibility this is the mantra that held the team together like super glue it was beautiful poetic and something that i just never expected to see in an mcu movie in regards the pacing fans mentioned that mcu peter parker probably should have mentioned his own ben parker in this moment honestly i think this doesn't deter from the message that peter lost both his aunt and uncle it just seems like ben's death affected may parker more than anything else in this particular universe Two things are obvious about the MCU version of Ben Parker. Number one, like I said, whatever happened hurt May Parker a lot more than Peter. This is why he never wanted her to know that he was Spider-Man. She was the one who told Peter about great power, great responsibility, something that had to be passed down from Uncle Ben. Number two, he still blames himself for being powerless to stop it. Not sure if this was pre-bite or post-bite, he did say in this line of dialogue from Civil War, look, when you can do the things that I can, but you don't, and then bad things happen, they happen because of you. Either way, I think it will be fine. Spider-Man freshman year will probably tie in that connective tissue together about what happened to Uncle Ben in the first place. 
We move from the lab as they synthesize a cure before going to the final battleground. The Statue of Liberty holds Captain America's shield, serving as a battle for supremacy as they lure the villains out. Once the lure is complete, then the goal will be to inject them with the serum, therefore curing them of their powers. This part is like comedy gold. The comedic timing is so good and all kinds of shit really. This is the conversation you wanted to see Tobey Maguire, Tom Holland, and Andrew Garfield have. The synergy just bounces off like a ping pong ball hitting solid concrete. All the fan theories, questions, and even the memes are brought up during this time. Want to hear how Peter 2 is questioned for shooting organic web from his body? They talk about it here. Did Toby's back ever get better? They talk about it here. Ever wanted to see Andrew act like a kid in a candy store when the notion of fighting aliens came up? They talk about it here. Want to see Toby and Tom's confused reactions when Tom mentions Thanos? It's all talked about. Toby even mentions Harry Osborn trying to kill him in a prior scene. So it's like this nerdy blend of experience draining into one big movie. It's so goddamn phenomenal and I don't think I've seen a Spider-Man script so well written since Spider-Man 2 and Into the Spider-Verse. Now, the final battle reaches its humble beginnings. Tom, Toby, and Andrew can't coordinate through team mechanics, so Peter One or Tom Holland tries coaching them instead. He's fought Thanos, he's done this before, it all makes sense. They all use their collective instinct to inject the cure into the bad guys one by one as it depowers them. You get a few moments involving closure between them, but I think the most emotional one for me was when Tom failed to catch Michelle. Michelle is then saved by Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. You can see him welling. You can see the tears in his eyes. You can feel that relief of emotion. Gwen Stacy's death didn't attribute towards you being a complete failure. You are amazing. And you saved someone very important to Peter one. And I felt that. Andrew finally got the closure that he deserved since he doubted himself for the longest time after The Amazing Spider-Man 2. You get a glimpse of Andrew's pain when he sees Tom together with Michelle. This is so powerful. This is powerful storytelling on display here. And it's equally powerful when you see Peter 2 gain some solace with mutual respect with Doc Ock again. It's so fulfilling to see that these two are friends again. Against all the odds, against the inhibitor chip, everything has changed for the better for both of them. They're trying to be better men. And you feel that sense of warmness that Toby, Peter too, once again, Peter too, he finally has his mentor back. Then we cut to the final battle. It's brutal intense and non-stop vicious on all fronts even before this just think about the lab scene toby says that they have to cure all of them when talking about norman osborne directly tom internally rejects but agrees to hide all suspicion it's clear that he has a personal vendetta in mind which deviates from the plan Peter One is out for pure crimson blood against the Green Goblin. He's no longer pulling his punches. He sends a flurry of fists repeatedly into Norman's face. He's trying to kill this guy. Remember that Spider-Man can easily lift 10 tons of mass and Norman Osborn is just eating every single knuckle sandwich solid fists that could lift 10 tons of mass. Then after he's beaten him to a pulp, Peter One grabs the glider, preparing to impale Norman Osborn to death before Peter Two stops him. They don't want a vengeful path for Peter One, knowing how miserable they felt after the fact when dealing with their own pain. 
Peter 2 and Peter 3 wants Peter 1 to be a better man since revenge didn't taste good when the dish was served hot. I also felt this was a bit poetic since Peter 2 stopped Peter 1 from using the glider and the glider is what killed Green Goblin originally. Moving out of the way in Spider-Man 1 changed Peter 2's life forever because in that moment it served as a downward spiral for his relationship with the Osborns. After all, his best friend forever hated him for this situation. Harry was consumed by revenge and only found out later that it was Norman who killed himself. Peter 2 stopping the glider is low key another impactful moment that people just fail to understand. As the lizard said, it doesn't come without consequence as Toby is stabbed deep by Goblin. People thought Toby was dead. I was like, no, don't do this to me, please. And then we find out that he's not dead. So hooray. The cure was injected into Norma's neck after this happened, getting rid of the goblin persona forever. Then a riff opens, showing Scorpion, Craven, and Rhino trying to pour into the multiverse. They're all here because they know about Peter Parker's identity. Peter then makes a sacrifice to do a spell right this time. It's basically the same spell as it was supposed to be in the beginning, except the whole world will forget about him all over again. This is like one more day done right, correcting a selfish reason, then turning it into a responsible one to save the world and not ruin the multiverse anymore. He says his heartbreaking final goodbyes, especially for MJ, before he trails away. The implications for this hit hard because Peter gets to retain his memories, yet Aunt May is dead, MJ and Ned don't know him, and he has no more access to Stark Tech toys. All the Iron Boy Jr. folks now have to come up with some new material because he is truly lost. He is truly on his own now. He has a broke rinky dink apartment on top of that as well. He tries connecting with Michelle Jones and you could tell she doesn't remember but the emotional connection is still prevalent. Peter decides to leave the shop, happy to see her but reluctant to find love yet again. He dons a new homemade suit which is similar to the classic Spider-Man suit with the lighter blue. It's almost like there was some inspiration taken from Peter 2 and Peter 3 respectively, and thus the movie reaches a conclusion right here. This is the perfect capstone movie to Tom Holland Spider-Man. He really went through this big emotional journey of wanting to be an Avenger to the responsibility of wanting to be a hero. Now he's a man realizing true loss and the price to pay for doing the right thing for the greater good. Each movie symbolizes growth as he slowly understands the weight of responsibility. In many ways, this movie was amazing, thought provoking, and it had the best kind of fan service. While there was some minor plot details that weren't told well, or some villains were underutilized, I can't say I didn't enjoy this movie to pieces. This is like up there with the top three rankings of the Spider-Man movie criteria that I have for sure. And I would be crazy if I didn't give this film an immediate 10 out of 10 right out of the gate. The fight scenes were also dope. Sure, you can nitpick the CGI or the rubber men, but honestly, I don't even care after the money shot of those three Spider-Men landing on the Statue of Liberty. If you are a fan of MCU Spider-Man, Raimi-verse, or Tasm-verse, then it's hard to not love every single second of this film. All the Spideys had an act to play, whether it was big, small, or emotional. I would pay a ticket for $100 if I could see Tom, Toby, and Andrew interact some more as these characters. God, I wish this movie was like three hours long. I, like, I would pay to have this happen. Three hours of Spider-Man talking and doing shit. Like, that is like unparalleled in my opinion. 
there isn't a perfect movie that exists despite giving this movie a 10 out of 10. It just means that I immensely enjoyed this film and the flaws were very minuscule compared to the pros. No one phoned it in. It was a well acted movie and it was mostly just, oh my God fucking orgasm just so good I love spider-man no way home also um the post credits were hilarious eddie brock's venom was blipped from the multiverse making a claim that he needed to have a little chat with new york's mcu spider-man when the universe was restored he went right back to the sony verse so that is pie in the face of Amy Pascal. This might be a little bit disappointing if you wanted to see Tom Hardy stick around a little bit longer in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. However, the bigger implication is that the symbiote dropped on the table, meaning that the symbiote is now inside of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. With confirmation involving a new Tom Holland trilogy, I think it's clear to say that the black suit will probably get onto him and Secret Wars will be a reality. Yes, everyone not knowing Peter Parker is a huge ramification at the same time i think this is all temporary considering the secret wars implication i do believe that peter's identity might be discovered again or the mantle will be passed considering how tom holland was miles morales in the mcu they did make a miles morales illusion with electro and um i think he said Oh man, you know, I saw you unmasked for Peter 3. I saw you unmasked and I thought you were black. I, I think they're setting up that whole Miles Morales thing. We had like Aaron Davis in Spider-Man Homecoming, I believe. So yeah, I think Miles is definitely going to come and they're going to keep putting out Spider-Man movies. Like I said before, Spider-Man fatigue, people thinking that there is a Spider-Man fatigue. My video aged like wine on that topic. Spider-Man fatigue does not exist because Spider-Man content is so good that I don't think people are tired of it. I, I really don't. I think we're going to see the exaggerated swagger of a black teen and it's going to be on the silver screen. Miles is definitely coming. Ah oh, man, such excitement coming for the future. I could feel it. I love you guys. P.S. Also, make the Amazing Spider-Man 3 under the MCU banner, please. Uh, sign with care and concern, baby. The other illusion is that Doctor Strange's teaser was shown at the end of this film, and I think I'll save that for like a separate video, but there you go. That is my review of Spider-Man No Way Home. 10 out of 10 great movie enjoyed it thoroughly a plus anyway this is renegade operative signing out what do you guys think of this review comment below and let me know like the video share it it always helps i appreciate all you guys merry goddamn christmas and hopefully you guys have a good new year i will see you guys next time check me out in the description on social media and i will see you guys soon later peace and adios don't beat up Santa Claus with Spider-Man powers, please. Just, just don't do that. <laughs> Remember the name of the game. We have to remain as peaceful street level Spider-Man. Be sure to uh, keep the neighborhood safe and watchful for me.